Hi, uh, my name is Owen Campbell-Moore. I'm a product manager on the Chrome team. And I work to make sure that the web is the best platform that it can possibly be for both developers and users. And today, I'm going to be talking about uh, creating user experiences that just feel right when your users are using them on their mobile devices and doing that with progressive web apps. And so before I jump in to talk about UX, I want to take a moment to talk about why I think the web is such an exciting and fascinating platform um, to build for as developers. So you will have all heard yesterday in Sundar's keynote how uh, Chrome now has over 2 billion monthly active users, which is just a huge number. And that's just Chrome alone. When we look at the whole uh, spectrum of the web, we see that there are over 5 billion devices running web browsers. And so this means that if you're building for the web, there's this incredible uh, large potential addressable audience that you have, this amazing potential reach. I think that's a really fascinating and unique property that the web has. And there's been a huge rate of uh, development in the last few years. Um, performance has gotten so much better. In the last year alone, according to the speedometer benchmark, uh, JavaScript performance on Chrome for Android is now 35% faster. And so I think that these uh, improvements in performance mean that it's possible to do a lot more than it was possible to do previously. And another thing that I love about the web is how it's fundamentally open. There's no one company that's in control and decides what happens on the web. It's really thousands of developers across lots of different companies and web browsers and open standards organizations um, that are all working together to push the web forwards. And it's really been designed over the last 20 years uh, to have this amazing property where users should be able to click one link and immediately have that content streamed to them so they can access it instantly. Uh, no need to kind of bundle up 10, 20 megabytes of resources, upload them to a store, um, and then have users go through some kind of install process to download and get that onto their device. And that's a really fascinating property for the platform, uh, in part because it means that uh, your users can potentially just tap a link and be in your experience immediately, which means uh, you can reach a lot more users. And from a purely business perspective, it means that customer acquisition costs are much lower. So in the last few years, we've seen this huge shift to mobile. Uh, and in, in particular, this has been interesting uh, because native has really been great on mobile. It's taken advantage of the unique capabilities of those devices. And on the web, you had this great reach. Users could tap a link and try your experience. But there was no way for that user to get the features that they've come to expect on mobile, to be able to get push notifications and a home screen icon, and all of these aspects that allow users to come back over and over again. And so that's been a really big focus for us uh, in the last few years. And in addition, um, the shift to mobile uh, has been a really big shift in interaction. Previously on desktop, users had a keyboard and they had a mouse, and everything was indirect. You were moving a mouse, which moved a cursor on the screen. Uh, but now we're on mobile. Users are dragging things, and they're swiping things. They're tapping things on the screen. And this means that the quality of experience just has to be that much higher, because when a user is physically manipulating something on the screen, it really has to respond and do what they expect to create a good experience. So this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Specifically, uh, how do we design for the web, especially for mobile devices? Uh, so this will build upon general UX principles and general principles of good mobile design and good design. Uh, but it will focus specifically on the challenges and unique opportunities presented by the web. So this talk was named uh, How to Build User Experiences That Just Feel Right on Mobile Devices. And so to dig into that, I think we've all had uh, lots of experiences on the web where we open a page and we're scrolling and it's just not really responding and we tap it. It feels kind of kludgy and slow and old fashioned. Um, and so this is a kind of common emotion and feeling on lots of websites. And so I want to kind of think about those are the symptoms and can we really dig in and understand those symptoms and understand the causes for those such that we can work out how to go and address them. And so the first common symptom that we see is that sites often aren't reactive. 
So here you can see I'm tapping a link on developers.google.com, and then I'm kind of waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm on a mobile device, so who knows what my network is like. And really, this wait is almost indeterminate. This is kind of in contrast to uh, when things were developed on desktop, and probably this was developed on a desktop device, where they were running a local server, and they tapped the button, and in half a second, the next page was there, and it just felt fine. Uh, but on mobile devices and real-world networks, that's just not the case. And so often, sites just don't feel like they're reactive. Next, sites often aren't predictable. So here you can see we're looking at the Google I.O. website. I've opened the hamburger menu, and then I'm trying to swipe it away but it's not responding to my input. It's not swiping away. To me, this is a little bit like working in an office that has all pull doors everywhere. And then one day, someone goes and installs a sliding door, but they think, oh, I'll put a pull sign on it and a handle, because that's what all the other doors have, so that'll be good. Um, and obviously, that's going to create a very confusing and frustrating experience, and that's something that we often see on the web. And thirdly, users often just aren't in control when they're on the web. So here you can see me loading an article, scrolling, and then it's kind of jumping underneath me. I'm sure we've all had this experience when we're trying to read or we're trying to tap a link, and then everything just shifts underneath us uh, as the content appears and loads in elsewhere on the page. This is also a very common experience uh, that we've seen and is a big problem. Uh, Another good example of where the user isn't in control is if they're on a list of, say, products on an e-commerce site, they tap an item and then realize they tapped the wrong one. Now they're waiting three, five, 10. Actually, well, the average page load time on mobile um, is 19 seconds. So they're waiting a really long time for that page. They know it's the wrong one, so they hit back. And now they're kind of staring at the screen wondering, is, is the page I was tapping on loading? Is the back page loading? Do I need to hit back again? What's going on? And this can turn a minor mistake into an experience where they accidentally leave the whole site because they hit back too many times. And so really, users often aren't in control. And these are some of the big issues that we, we see. And so today, I want to share a secret with all of you. Are you all ready? So the secret is that websites can feel amazing. So this is actually a pretty well-kept secret, I think. Um, and so there's this huge amount, like the history of the web means there's this huge amount of legacy content that was really not designed with mobile in mind, not designed for the networks and the interaction. And this means that the vast majority of existing content uh, just isn't designed for the modern world. And I think that this means that a lot of the time we experience the web in this way and therefore think, oh, well, this is how the web is. This is how it feels. This is how it must be. And so if you take away one thing from this talk, it's that uh, websites can really feel amazing and can do more. Um, and here's a great example of a web app that I think does a lot more. So here we have Twitter.com. They recently launched this pro as a progressive web app um, a couple months ago. So you can try it on your mobile device. And you can see as I'm tapping the tabs, it's very responsive. I can tap Compose, tap through all of the tweets. And this is actually simulated on a very slow, I think, 2 or 3G network. And it all just feels really good. And uh, you can actually see that it's also running in this kind of immersive mode where there's no Omnibox. There's no distracting browser UI. And that's another feature of the progressive web app. Since I've added to home screen this, kind of like a lightweight install I have the icon, and once I launch it from the home screen, it runs in this kind of rich, immersive mode, which creates a really nice experience. And so this is a nice example of what's possible. And so I said that this is a progressive web app. And so what are progressive web apps? Well, at their core, they're really just radically better web experiences, and they are kind of fundamentally enabled by a new set of browser-standardized capabilities and APIs that have been shipped over the past few years. For example, Service Worker is this amazing new API that allows websites to really fundamentally take control of the networking on the page in order to make it uh, performant and fast and reactive, regardless of the network condition, even if the user is fully offline. Essentially, it lets you kind of keep a stored copy of your uh, web app on the user's device. So as they're using it, you're not downloading every page each time or downloading the whole app every time they browse to it. And another thing that I think is uh, really important about progressive web apps, actually besides the capabilities and the technical aspects, is uh, the idea of it as a label and kind of a thing that we can aspire towards. We have this big problem on the web of this legacy content that doesn't work very well. And I think that by having this label where we can say, these are progressive web apps, these are great experiences, uh, 
we can reset expectations for ourselves and our companies um, and for our users that things can be great. And so that's one of the reasons why I think PWA is so exciting. And so over the last 18 months, we on the Chrome team have had the great opportunity to work with a bunch of the world's best developers in rebuilding their uh, mobile sites as progressive web apps, or just coming to the web for the first time, from Twitter launching Twitter Lite to Lyft launching their progressive web app for the first time. And in that process, we've had a chance to really understand the common problems and look at the demos and the prototypes and work out what works well. And we've boiled down three key principles that we call the feel-good principles that we think really explain uh, what makes a web experience feel good to users as they're using it. So the first principle is reactive. Site should be reactive to users' input. Uh, really, the word responsive would have been better in here, but you know, responsive web design is already a thing. And um, so reactive is the word uh, we're using today. Uh, secondly, uh, sites should be predictable, and they should offer predictable user experiences that users can expect and understand. And thirdly, users should always be in control of their experience. So let's dig into this first one, reactive. Sites should be reactive to users' input. And when we're talking about reactivity, I think first it's important to think about uh, perceived performance, because we're really talking about performance here, and what counts is how users experience it. And so there's this quote that I love from a kind of classic paper in this field, which says, human perception of time is fluid and can be manipulated in purposeful and productive ways. So this is a quote that comes from a great paper about designing uh, loading bars and about how to create good experiences of loading bars that make users feel like the experience is really fast and avoid them feeling frustrated. And their research, uh, amongst lots of others, has demonstrated that user perception of time is fluid. And so as we're thinking about building reactive websites, we should be thinking about how users perceive performance, knowing that a page loads in five seconds is great, but if users can think that it loads just in one second because we can use some, some tricks, that's even better. And, and the data actually backs that up and says that uh, users do engage more thanks to this perceived in performance. So the first uh, example I want to show um, is kind of like what we saw before, a transition that's blocked on the network. Here you can see me tapping a listing, and then I'm waiting really an indeterminate amount of time until suddenly the next page appears. And so this can be frustrating. Um, and here we can see uh, actually what housing.com, the progressive web app here, has done, where when the user taps on a listing, they're immediately taken to the next screen. The information that was known before, the image and the title, is reused on that next screen. And the user is given an idea of the structure of the page so they can start understanding that, take a few seconds to process that whilst the download is happening. And so this is a really big improvement in uh, user experience and is a pattern that we've seen uh, very successfully being used across lots of progressive web apps. Next, a big issue that we've often seen with progressive web app developers is uh, trying to do responsive touch feedback um, and finding that it's just not really responding to the user's input. So here, if you look really closely, you can see that I'm tapping on this demo button on the Material UI docs page. Uh, Material UI, by the way, is an implementation of material design for the React framework. So as I'm tapping demo, uh, this should be a material button. There should be a nice ripple. And in fact, if you look at the code, there is a ripple. But when you go on a low-end phone and you just tap it, there's not. And so why? Uh, to understand this, let's take a look at a simplification of the code for how this would look. Here we have the button, and we add an event listener for the click event. And when the user clicks on that button, we're going to add a class to the button. This class will trigger the animation. And then we call render next screen. And this probably does a bunch of React code, preparing the next screen, and then swaps it in. Now, the problem here is that when you actually set a class on something in JavaScript, that doesn't actually happen immediately. And uh, in this case, the render next screen code is what we call blocking the main thread. It's doing so much busy work that the change to the class actually uh, doesn't get time to be applied. And so this is kind of a weird quirk that we have. But it's fairly simple to solve. The way to solve it is to uh, use this trick that we call a double request animation frame, or a double RAF. 
And so here, what we're doing is after we add that class, we say to the browser, hey, wait until the next frame. And then we say, wait until the next frame again, and then start rendering the next screen. And so what this does is it ensures that that uh, CSS change has been applied. It's made it um, off onto the other process. Um, and then when we call uh, render next screen, it can block the main thread, but the animation is already going, and uh, it won't be blocked by that work. And so this is a really good uh, trick that I'd recommend that you think about whenever you're implementing kind of tabs or buttons or really anything that, uh, that the user should expect to get a response from. Think about using this to make sure that uh, things don't get blocked. Because if you're testing your sites always on kind of the, the latest Pixel or the latest iPhone or on your desktop, you often don't notice these issues. But when you try them on the really low-end mobile devices that realistically a lot of users are using, um, these issues can really become a problem. And so here we can see the docs page with that fix applied. I'm tapping the demo button, and there's a nice material ripple, as you would expect. Next, I want to talk about kind of infinite lists. So infinite lists are a common uh, feature that we see on sites, especially with feeds. Sites like Twitter or Facebook or Tumblr um, often let you scroll infinitely through a list. And here you can see a page where I put 1,000 of these rows, and I'm trying to scroll through it. And uh, it's actually rendering blank for a lot of it, which is really weird. And I found in reality, when I was uh, writing some code to keep adding elements to this page, it got really sluggish and slow, and the memory uh, got really large. If you go on a site um, that uses one of these and you just keep scrolling and watch the memory tab, uh, the memory information, you can see uh, these sometimes take multiple gigabytes of memory, which just grinds everything to a halt. So this is, this is a problem that we need to be thoughtful about. And so there's a solution to this, which is to use what are called virtualized lists. Essentially, this is a technique that means when that component goes off the screen, it's actually removed from the DOM. It's removed from the page. And so really, only the things that are within view and a few on either side are rendered. And actually, here, this is a page with 100,000 elements on it. Um, and so this can really scale very well and was a key that actually Twitter found when they were building Twitter Lite that was key to making sure that their uh, list scrolls really well and that the user can sit there and use Twitter for a long time and have it be performant. So virtualized lists is a great tool. Next, one of the big questions that we get when we talk about uh, building reactive websites is, how do I do native UI on the web? And for Android developers, this often means, how do I do material on the web? And so I want to give a quick shout out to a few different uh, implementations of material that you can go and take a look at. At the top, we have the Polymer elements. So this is a set of elements built by Google, built by the Polymer team that implement material design. And the Polymer team are here today, so you can go and chat with them in the mobile web tent and hear all about it. Secondly, if you're interested in React, there's this implementation, Material UI, that we saw a little uh, screen grab from earlier, which is great, so you can check that out. And if you want something a bit more framework agnostic, then Google has also published the material components for web. And these aren't tied to any framework. They're vanilla JavaScript and CSS. And you can pull them into any project that you're working on. Now, I can't really talk about building reactive websites without touching on load performance. Since the first time a user comes to their site, their first experience is part of it being reactive um, to what they're trying to do. And so here on the left, we can see the improvement that uh, the major company OLX saw in India when they launched their progressive web app and used some of these patterns. So there are these techniques that if you're not familiar with, I recommend that you go and just look up. The first one is the purple pattern. This is about a way of ensuring that you're loading resources effectively and reusing them effectively to make everything very fast. Secondly, there's service worker caching. So service worker is one of those new standardized APIs that's been added to the web recently that allows the controlling of the network. And so this is really good for when the user comes back to your site. You can have the resources already available on the device. And third, server-side rendering. So these days, people are building a lot richer experiences on the web. They're very app-like. They have a big framework and lots of resources. And sometimes this means that if to get that very first render, you have to download all of those resources, uh, then it's going to be a slow first render. And so there's a technique, server-side rendering, where you can render the first view on the server and send that down. And then we say hydrate it on the client once the other resources have been loaded and it make it interactive. And talking about this kind of first load performance, 
Uh, given that we're talking about design, I think it's really important to touch on fonts. So as designers, fonts are a really valuable tool in our toolkit for creating these uh, great experiences. Uh, but on the web, there's this common problem uh, where you know, fonts can be a megabyte, two megabytes in size. And so if you want to really rely on that font for the first load of your application, you can end up with something like you see here, where everything is downloaded, all of the text is there, but it's, the font isn't yet downloaded. And so it's unstyled. It's blank. And this is a big problem. So there's a couple tips that I would recommend thinking about. Firstly is to consider using device fonts. So these days, devices ship with a large set of default fonts. And often, just by choosing between them, you can get a good kind of artistic expression that you're, you're interested in. Secondly, if, if a custom font is really important to you for a kind of header or a logo, consider using an image or an SVG. Often, these can just be like 10 kilobytes instead of a megabyte. And so this can be a much better uh, trick to use. And thirdly, another good pattern is to use custom fonts, but use them on subsequent loads. So once they're available, use them. Until they're available, make sure that you're not. And if you're pulling fronts from Google fonts, uh, there's an option that lets you do this. So just keep your eye out for it and make sure that uh, you're trying your site on really slow networks. You're trying that first load and checking how the fonts are working. Now, I've given a bunch of different tips on how to build your sites and make sure that they feel reactive. I want to share a couple tools to make it easier to make sure that you're hitting all of these. The first is Lighthouse. So Lighthouse doesn't do all of the things that we've talked about in terms of uh, helping with skeleton screens and responsive uh, touch input. But it does help a lot with many aspects, and we're building on it uh, rapidly. So Lighthouse is a new Chrome extension built by the Chrome team that you can run on any page. And it gives you this personalized report that explains how all the different aspects of it are working and gives you pointers about areas that you should look at, areas of opportunity. There are another couple tools which are worth mentioning. Uh, PageSpeed Insights is another Google tool that helps you understand the performance of your page loads. And Web Page Test is a great non-Google tool that helps you say, you know, What's the experience like of loading my website on a Moto 4G in Bangalore? And it'll give you back a video of it loading and kind of traces and timelines and help you see how that's working. So this is a really powerful tool for understanding real world uh, how users would experience your site. So that was about how to make sure that your site is reactive to the user's input. Next, I want to talk about how to make sure it's predictable and that your user experiences are understandable. So here we saw the example earlier of a hamburger menu that the user is trying to swipe away, and that just doesn't swipe. So this is a problem. And here, instead, we can see the progressive web app recently launched by the company Wego. This is built using Polymer and the Polymer uh, elements. And so here, I'm able to drag the left nav. I'm able to fling it, and it works just like you'd expect. So here's another example similar to the hamburger menu. There are tabs on this site, and I'm trying to just swipe between those tabs, as I've been trained to expect. But it's not working. And so this is a confusing experience. So instead of that, here's a, the docs page for React swipeable views, which is a performant way of having these swipeable tabs or swipeable views somewhere in your application. So go and check this out if you're uh, looking at doing swipeable views for some reason. But actually, there's another tip that uh, I like to think about when thinking about navigation, which is sometimes it's best just to keep it simple. With both the hamburger menu and with those tabs, we have this implication of gestural navigation, which can be challenging to do a good job of, especially if you're interested in uh, serving users on low-end devices. And in fact, the hamburger menu has a number of usability problems around discoverability of the items in that menu. So sometimes it's best just to keep it simple there's this uh, pattern called a bottom navigation, uh, which doesn't have the same implications of gestural swiping. It's also much easier to tap for the user with their thumb. Uh, and it's more discoverable, because they can see immediately what's available. So think about keeping it simple with a bottom navigation instead of going really deep on the other areas. So the next aspect of predictability uh, I want to talk about is this gotcha that we call the blue flash which incidentally, I think, sounds like a great superhero name if anyone uh, needs one for any reason. Um, so the blue flash, what is it? So here we can see I'm tapping on the hamburger button, and I'm tapping to dismiss it. And the screen is kind of flashing blue in that area. 
So why is this happening? Well, this turns out, again, to be a, uh, due to the legacy content on the web. We had this big problem in the early days of the web where uh, the user would tap on some content, and then they'd be stuck waiting. And so we made this decision to have links uh, go blue for a couple for a brief amount of time so the user knows that the tap was recognized and that they know that they need to wait. But these days, when we're building these rich experiences that are going to be responding to user input immediately, uh, this blue flash is really just a distraction, and it takes away from the design. So if you want a blue flash, great. You get one by default. Um, if you don't want a blue flash, it's really easy to fix. You just add this one line of CSS, WebKit tap highlight color, and then this is a RGB alpha value. The zero at the end means the alpha is zero. It's transparent. So this makes the blue flash transparent. So this is just a small example of the polish that you can bring to your websites. Now, thirdly, the user should always be in control when they're on your site. And so earlier, we saw this example of uh, loading an article and it jumping out from underneath us, which is probably a common experience that we've all had. So the alternative to that is what we call the stable load. This is where uh, images and dynamic components have their size predetermined such that the browser knows how to lay out everything on the screen even before they're downloaded. And so this is the solution. Just specify those sizes. And it really allows the user to uh, interpret the page better, not accidentally tap on the wrong thing. Another case where uh, I personally find I'm kind of taken out of my context and diverted is sometimes with permissions on the web. So there's this pattern that I'm seeing a lot at the moment where I'll land on some kind of e-commerce site or some news site, and the first thing that I see is a bar appear at the bottom saying the website wants to send you notifications. At this point, the user really doesn't have any context to make this decision. They don't know what you're going to send them notifications about. Um, and you probably have multiple calls to action on the page. Here, there's different browse buttons. So it's unclear what uh, we're expecting users to do at this point. Instead, I really like what Twitter's done, which is where when you tap on their notifications tab, if you haven't previously enabled push notifications, they show this full screen overlay asking the user if they want to opt in and get push notifications. Incidentally, push notifications are one of the new features, the new standardized features brought by progressive web apps. So you can now build uh, web experiences that can send native notifications on Android and on desktop that look and feel uh, just as you would expect. So those were the feel-good principles. Sites should be reactive to users' input. They should have predictable user experiences and not set up uh, things that are going to trip up users. And users should always be in control, fundamentally. And what we've seen, actually, in the last 18 months from companies shipping new progressive web apps that follow these principles is really good results. Uh, we've published a whole bunch on, uh, if you Google progressive web app case study, you'll find a whole bunch from lots of different companies. This is just a few, 100% increase in session duration from Forbes, 170% increase in page views from Twitter, and 76% higher conversions from Alibaba. So this is potentially a very major impact on business. Now I want to talk quickly about uh, how better UX is now being built into browsers and how you can do things that you couldn't do before thanks to these new capabilities being built in. So the first of these is Smart Lock. So Smart Lock is this capability that means that if a user has ever logged into your service on any device, native or on the web, then when they transition to another device, they can be automatically logged in without needing to remember their username and password. We find that uh, when users are presented with a login screen, that actually the majority of them often just leave the site at that point, and they don't ever make it through that login screen. And so this is a really key part of your flow that you can optimize with this new capability, Smart Lock, which is also called Credential Manager if you're looking it up. Next, the Payment Request API. So the data shows that uh, approximately 65% of users on mobile that get to a checkout screen don't end up uh, completing that checkout. And when we ask them why, most of them say that it's because the form was too long or too hard to fill in. 
And so payment requests lets you tell the browser uh, what the price is and what the product is. And then the browser will render this native form that's already filled in with all of the user's information that we already have. The user can just tap pay, and then you get all of that form information back. You get the credit card details, the address, all of those things that you would expect. But the user didn't have to retype them in. And so this can be really a uh, big impact on e-commerce. And thirdly, uh, service workers allow you to build experiences that work on flaky networks really performantly or even when fully offline. So here you can see Conga. This is a progressive web app in Africa uh, where they've shipped their experience such that if the user goes offline, they can look back at items they've looked at previously. They can you know, take their phone home and show their, their partner what they were looking at even without internet. And actually, um, with their experience, when you're on that product listing page, they give you a phone number to call. And you can actually call that phone number and convert on that item without internet at a later point. So these are some of the new things that are possible on the web. In fact, in the last year alone, we've shipped over 215 new APIs on the web. New APIs like web Bluetooth and image capture that gives you full control over the camera and the focus and aperture. So if you've ever thought, oh, I can't do that on the web, um, I have to do native for some reason, just go back and take a look and see if it's now possible, because a lot of things really are. The web has come a, a really long way. And finally, um, I'd like to share a kind of debate that's currently going on on the web in this area. So there's this common question that we get. Should I tweak my PWA to visually fit in with Android or iOS? Especially when running in that immersive mode, what are users what do they expect? I think this is a really fascinating question. It's very philosophical. Some people would argue that the web should evolve its own aesthetic and its own design patterns, and users should become accustomed to web design as a concept. Um, other people would argue that you should fully adjust how your experience works on iOS and Android like you would a native app. At the end of the day, the user is holding the phone, and it looks the same. So why should we draw this user experience barrier based on technology, JavaScript versus Java? It should be about the form factor and the user's context, which I think is another great point. Um, a really interesting example of uh, one company's way of handling this. Well, uh, so this is the progressive web app from the city of Barcelona for their tourists. It works offline. You can store different uh, sites and the information and maps. Um, and what they've done is they've kept the same fundamental structure across Android and iOS, but they've uh, tweaked the design. They've changed the colors and the typography. Uh, they've centered the header. And they've really made it feel a little more native, but while keeping the fundamental underlying structure the same. This is a really interesting pattern. And I think this is an area where a lot more exploration needs to happen, a lot more discussion. If you have thoughts about this, I'd love to see blog posts and see people trying different things. And finally, if you're interested in going out from here and building a progressive web app, trying out what it's like, there's a couple ways I'd recommend looking at getting started. Uh, the first is the Polymer CLI. So Polymer recently released a new command line tool that makes it really easy to get up and running. Uh, it gives you all of the basics of an app, including service worker caching, all of those various aspects. And then on the React side, there's this great tool, Create React App, which lets you get started with React without setting up a whole build process. You won't have to deal with Babel or Grunt or Gulp or any of those, um, any of those things. Uh, and in fact, uh, Create React App just announced at Google I.O. that any, um, any web apps built with Create App will be progressive web apps by default. They'll have service workers built in and uh, do a lot of these things just straight out of the box. So these are two really good places to get started. And remember that uh, when you go out and start building these things, uh, use skeleton screens and those kind of techniques to make sure that your site is reactive to the user's input. Uh, consider keeping things simple and using a bottom navigation instead of the gestural input. Or if you do the gestural input, be thoughtful about it so your site is predictable to users. And use techniques like stable loading to ensure that your site isn't jumping around underneath users' fingers in order to keep the user in control. And so uh, I think we have a couple minutes now for uh, Q&A if you'd like to stick around. But otherwise, I've been Owen. You've been a wonderful audience. I hope you enjoy the rest of I.O. Thank you very much.